Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Secret History of History Color Wars Part 2. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted that we have Catherine E. McKinley with us to discuss Indigo Blue. Um, she has the author of this really incredible book. You see some of my, my notes here, Indigo in Search of the Color that Seduced the World. And um, together with Catherine, we're going to look at indigo blue in a truly unique way. Um, perhaps you came to our previous program on cochineal red, and today we get to dive into the blues. Catherine is also the author of the recently published The African Lookbook. She'll be sharing images from that book as she tells you the story of indigo. She has been a Fulbright scholar in Ghana, and I, I Feel that we are going to be transported today, which I think we are, are looking for in our lives, um, even though we do, some of us have some spring weather to enjoy. Now, just before I turn it over to Catherine, I'm going to explain why we are doing a talk on indigo at the Spy Museum. Well, um, if you visited the museum, you may have seen our very last gallery towards the end. This is a, a sense of what it looks like. And it tells different tales of economic espionage through the years. And these range from the tactics that Venice used um, to protect trade secrets in the Renaissance to a French affair bugging business class air travel. But my favorite part of the gallery is the color wars area and this is not a great photo and it's not a big gallery but this is just a tiny little section that focuses on indigo so obviously there's a lot more of the story to tell and for that over to you Catherine thank you for being with us oh, thank you so much for having me it's great to be here um I'll tell you a little bit about indigo just to begin with, because I think a lot of people have a sense of what indigo is. They have a sense of the color range and what it is, but they're not really sure of the particulars and what would make it so interesting to spying and to uh, international um, trade. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about indigo in a world context and what it meant for Africa, and then also give you a sense of re what really was at stake when people went after this with so much um, venom and when it became such an object of, of people's greed. So indigo is a small parasitic shrub um, and through a very delicate, long and very intense process, it grows into literal organisms in a dye vat and it becomes the indelible and remarkably costly and coveted dye stuff that we know today. It's a process that's really inexplicable, even for scientists. Um, you, when an object or when material is put into the dye bath and then brought up into the air so that it oxidizes, it moves from a very, very pale yellow through um, greens into light and then darker and darker blues with each submersion and each process of oxidation. And it, it's really just, it's a wonder to to watch. But even scientists have a hard time explaining what that process is for us. And it's all done with leaves and water and agents like ash and sugar and urine. And it's a kind of smelly thing. Even um, indigo textiles continue to hold some of those smells of, of urine in particular. So it's a kind of funny thing to love as much as we do. Um, in a parallel process, indigo became a substance that was used throughout the world and probably most remarkably for beauty as an eye makeup, as a thick paste. West African royals, women in particular, would put a thick paste into their hair. And it was a symbol of the leaching into the skin was incredibly beautiful. And it was also a symbol of their wealth and power. It was mixed with henna for the body and for the hair. Um, it was rubbed into African women's tattoos and especially in tattooing around the mouth. So you'll see some women in Senegal and Mali with blue 
tattoos around the lips and, and the chin, and then sometimes a line from the hairline down to the chin as well. And it was also rubbed into fresh wounds in body scarification to give them color and to give them substance, but also because it had a medicinal value. So it was literally placed into the body through this process of scarification. Um, it was used worldwide as an eye tincture. I think that even now you can go into your local store and you can buy indigo drops that are an eye tincture. Um, it was used in abortion quite widely throughout the world. And it was tattooed into areas where someone was arthritic or where there was infection in the body or where there was a need for some kind of healing The indigo was effective with. And it was famously an art matter. It was used in the decor of mosques and temples and churches to signify the divine. And for almost five millennia, it was used in really every major culture and religion and has been one of the most valued pigments in world history. It was used as an agent in religious rites and rites of birth and death and to signify the life between those two poles, the, the grave and the womb. Indigo grows in some species on every continent in the world, but the best dye qualities are extracted from plants grown in India and West Africa. And that rarity and the lengths required to obtain them made it extraordinarily valuable. The oldest evidence of indigo was found in Thebes on the bodies of Egyptian mummies dating 5,000 years back. Indigo similarly found, was found in the Americas long before the Europeans. The Nahauti of Guatemala used indigo and the oldest Inca mummies are often wrapped in it. Four, in 450 BC, Herodotus describes the use of indigo in the Mediterranean. In 1000 BC, it was found in writings on the Indian, in the Indian Veda, the book of knowledge by the sage who wrested the secret of creating fire. In 11th century Mali, it was um, left in caves where people were buried. And in 1275, Indigo Ferra Tintura, a native of Asia and considered the finest of the large global plant species had origins that were said to be in China, but were present there and spread by the Korean and Japanese traders who were working across Asia. It's the signature of the famous King Dynasty kimonos, especially the dragon robe. It signaled the elevated status of the wearer in most cultures in the world actually when it was, was used in clothing. And later it was associated with the Mao suit and it became ikat and shibori's and also Dutch wax cloth signature, the, the dark threads that run throughout those particular textiles. In 1948, Vasco da Gama is purported to have opened trade routes to indigo, to India, making indigo accessible to average Europeans. Indigo was superior to European woad, which France, Germany, and England cultivated extensively since the Roman Empire. Indigo becomes known as the devil's dye by woadites, so people who died and worked at woad and traded woad in Europe. And under Queen Elizabeth, for this reason, it was banned and dyers were made to take a uh, oath and would be killed if indigo was found in their possession. And the wearing of indigo remains a sanction of the elite, even today, although it's also been popularized through denim and, and other things. For Africa in particular, and here, Amanda, we could cue the first slide. This is, this is a photo of dyers in Mali. Um, for Africa, at the end of the 15th century, there were colonies established in Cape Verde Islands just off of Senegal. They were set up exclusively to process indigo and for the weaving of cloth that were used in the trade with Europe. The cloths were being produced by West African Muslim enslaved people and also by Japanese weavers who were brought by the Portuguese to the colony, particularly as weavers. 
and also Iberian artisans who were involved in that process. The cloth was used as a trade currency and there was a very, very rich bespoke market among both European elites and African ones for these cloths. And it was a popular, there was also at the same time a popular trade in plain indigo cloths in exchange for slaves. So if you look into the, the, um, the slave traders books, in the record books, you'll see that one body was traded for two yards of indigo cloth or a plain cloth or something similar, something equivalent. And in African societies, the cloth was currency. So you get to have a sense of, of this network of um, world economies and what made this so important and also so, um, so much a, a magnet for people's greed. It was in fact a hidden commodity of the slave trade. So it was, it's called one of what was the quote unquote hidden half of the slave trade. So just like gold and salt and other commodities, in addition to human lives, it was what was powering those ships that were moving between West Africa and Europe and um, the Caribbean and North America as well. In the 16th century, the Trans-Saharan trade linked caravan routes from Europe to traders in Cyprus, Alexandria, Baghdad, and Europe. And the value for indigo began to outpace the value of gold and ivory, et cetera. The legendary blue men of the Sahara, the Tuareg men, um, still famously wear an indigo cloth that has been around for, for centuries. And it was historically, the Tuareg, you, you are probably familiar with the photos of the blue men in swaths, Tuareg men in swaths of indigo cloth that leaches into the face and the hands. And that cloth historically was a toil of Nigerian Hausa concubines of the Emir who built an economy on the trade into the, Europe, into the Mediterranean and Europe. And it's a kind of hidden part of that history, women's involvement in the trade and also their wealth and the way that even as concubines, they were, were able to subvert the economy of the Emir and the power of the Emir. In the, late, um, in the late 1500s, France and Germany banned indigo and it was the reserve of the elites alone. And then into the late 1600s and early 1700s, indigo was drawn into every war in the nonstop battles involving the British, French, Austrians, and Spanish. So as those colonial powers fought, indigo was always one of the, the mainstays of the economy that was um, undergirding the war. The wars increased its sumptuary value and it remained the domain of the elite in fashion and art into the 17th century. Um, in the 17th century as oriental objects and fashion were like a near mania in Europe, uh, blue was recognized as a kind of primary color and its value increased even more. And then in, by 1730, indigo was legalized in Europe and blue became the most commonly used color. In 1785, China blue was, an, was made through an industrial process involving indigo. And it was devised by the famous Bromley Hall textile company. And then it became popularized even more. And around that time, we had the birth of Levi's in the, in the US, and it, which was traded rigorously in the transatlantic slave trade. And denim, there's a lot of talk recently about how denim is, um, we're starting to recognize the way in which denim in America was part of the intellectual property of the enslaved who brought indigo knowledge from Africa. Okay, we can go down the slide, next slide. This is, um, this is a photograph of a Wolof trader from the turn of the century. And she is in, um, on the border of Senegal and Mali, and she's wearing indigo wealth. So her, the textile she's wearing are all indigo. The skirt in particular is made in those workshops in um, Cape Verde Islands. And the part of the display of one's wealth in Europe and also 
in Africa was that volume to have a large volume of indigo textile. So that's what she represents. Um, let me just check one thing, I'm sorry. We can go through the next slide, please. And this again, oh, I'm sorry, yes. This is another Wolof woman from Senegal. And she's again showing these particular textiles that have the Iberian and Japanese and Wolof design elements in them all at once that were being produced in the, in the workshops in Cape Verde Islands. Catherine, mm -hmm. can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Are those designs, are they embroidered or are they batiked on? Just, just curious, because I know you show yeah. one later. This one, go, go down one more slide and I'll show you. Okay, so this is an actual Cape Verde Pano, and this is a completely woven cloth. And it's that melange of these different cultural influences in the design work. And then if you go back one slide to where we were, this is a, um, a hand-stitched, this is damask cloth, and then it's hand-stitched. And these cloths were made in Senegal, and they were kind of reproductions of the Cape Verde cloths that were, were meant to be less costly, but still have that, um, you know, the same social importance and the same value in the color and coloration of the dye. We can go forward again. One more. This is a, this is a detail of one of those same cloths. One more. And this is another detail of a, a darker dyed cloth, but you can see the damask underneath. And the, these would all be hand stitched with raffia, and then they would remove, the raffia would be the resist, and they would remove the threads and you'd have this patterning. Okay. And these cloths were very sought after in Europe. And this is a, um, this will bring us to our spy storytelling. This is a Wolof family in Senegal. Um, it's a, a trader and his family. And you see on the right that the two girls are mixed race. So they are um, Portuguese descendants. And this is where we start to see the kind of interesting history of, um, of trade wars. Because prior to the arrival of the Portuguese in the 1400s, there was a very, very rigorous trade in indigo along the coast of West Africa. So in particular from Southern Morocco down to um, Northern Angola, there were thriving markets. It was a very, very expensive commodity. And there was this rigorous trade with a lot of competition for knowledge about taste, people's taste, changes in the market, and then also how to get those cloths transported into the interior where there were buyers as well. And so West African traders were, and merchants were on the high seas. They were carrying the cloth on the high seas and then also by horse and with headquarters along the coastal, along the coastal markets. And um, there was, you know, it was a very cutthroat business. It's kind of, a surprise to many people because they don't often know how much of a commodity commodity cloth was, but typically for the 18 and 1900s, cloth represented between 40 and 60% of goods that were traded in the transatlantic slave trade. So it was, and it was something like 16% of every woman's household budget went to textiles. So textiles were very, very integral, very important to everything that was that was being done, um, ritually, socially, and then just in terms of, of dress. So what you would see is that they were beginning to be, with the arrival of the Portuguese, there was beginning to be intermarriage to allow people greater access to European power and European trade knowledge. And then also Europeans were seeking greater access to African relationships and trade knowledge, et cetera. 
So you see the beginning of mixed race families like this. And with the, the families, you are aware of a kind of depth of integration in the clock trade market in particular. So these are these are stories, these are photographs that would tell you a lot of information about a family's social standing and also where they sat in relationship to the indigo trade. Uh, and you know, most of the stories that we would like to hear have been lost to history. I've been trying to do some research to find out more about the particularities of the families and also what that trade economy looked like. But a lot of it is not on the record, unfortunately. So finding this photo for me was really, really fantastic. So I'll tell you a little about a little bit more about that. But first, um, let me just see. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so they were um so the Luso African merchants were working between the Cape Verde Islands in particular and they were going as far as the Gabon estuary in Angola and into Central Africa. They were exchanging ivory and slaves for indigo with the Portuguese colonialists who were the first Europeans to arrive in West Africa. And together, these African traders and also the Portuguese were setting up posts that were in previously completely uninhabited places and developing networks there and also um, plantations there. On the plantations, there were small workshops under merchant supervision with extremely skilled enslaved people who were doing the spinning and weaving and dyeing. And they were competing for the most valued and most elaborately patterned indigo cloths. They were able to exploit the presence of each other. This is the African and Portuguese traders, and particularly with the most power, those who were Luso African, who were able to put the, the two communities together and have um, familial power. And so by the 17th century, they were producing this loom made cloth, and the cloths were being traded as far away as the West Indies and Brazil, all of Europe, and um, a good part of the Americas. African merchants, big and small, were moving indigo and other cloths, um, you know, all across the continent on bicycles, Peugeots, steamships, motorbikes, carrying things on their head with a um, large number of head porters. And they had very, very elaborate trade networks involving agents and porters and kinship systems in particular. So, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a specific spy story to share, but I am sure you can imagine in a, in a region, West Africa in particular, where there, was, there has long, you know, even in pre-colonial times, there was a real love for what, and a penchant for fashion that was new and was considered quote unquote, the latest. The, and there was a hunger for rapidly changing, you know, ever more modern displays of one's wealth and and finery and also the kind of attending religious and spiritual beliefs. This, this was as cutthroat as any um, fashion week runway or any atelier in, in Paris or, or New York as well. So I'll, I can tell you a little bit now, if we shift our gaze, let's go down another photograph. Okay, these again, these are elites wearing indigo with the Luso African patterns can go for it again. And this was 1921. This is 1911 in Guinea. Okay, we can go forward. And this is a cloth that is a Dutch product. It's a Dutch industrialization of an Indonesian batik that was then sold to West Africa and became extremely valuable and, and caught up in this, this other trade, even though this is a, a Dutch factory made cloth. Can go forward. And this is indigo on one of those same Dutch wax cloths before they finished the process. But it shows you the, the, the saturation. So for one cloth, over a hundred small balls of dried indigo are involved in one indigo vat. And the color intensity comes from 
more and more accumulation of those of that dye. So you get to see how um, how the color looks when it's at its richest. You can go down again. This is a Nigerian cloth, and now we're in Nigeria. These are Adere cloths that are being produced in um, the Yoruba regions of Nigeria in particular, but then traded everywhere, traded to Kenya, all across West Africa, et cetera. Let's go down one more. This is another Adere. This one is called The Birds Are All Here. And this is um, hand-drawn. At, um, at that time, a lot of them were drawn by young girls who were pawns or concubines, sometimes enslaved. The, the first step of their process of initiation would be learning to do this kind of design work. Okay, next. Next one. This is a, this gives you an idea of some of the diversity of, of fabrics coming out of Nigeria in particular. Okay, the next. I think that's it. Oh, okay. So I'm going to tell you more about Nigeria. We could go back a slide just so okay. they can enjoy it. Here we are. Okay, so at the turn of the century, of the 20th century, we saw an introduction of chemical blue dyes. And those dyes, you know, in Europe and, and across the world, it began to fatally undercut the indigo wealth in the world. So the Russians had successfully synthesized blues in the 18th century, but the Germans introduced synthetic indigo, what was called indigo pure BASF in the 19, oh, my date is messed up. I'm sorry, I'll come back and give you, give you the correct date. Its originator was Johann Frederick Wilhelm Adolf van Bayer, and he had spent more than 20 years trying to unlock the science of indigo, something that I think even today we haven't successfully unlocked, although there is this synthetic process. For this and other innovations, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And soon after World War II, German companies BASF and ICI began to export commercial indigo. Indigo, as we know it as a completely, you know, now you can go and you can buy indigo from an art store or, you know, from various dyers. You can get the kits, I think, even, even on eBay. Um, you can make a quick indigo vat at home and everybody can call themselves an indigo dyer, but the actual process, the organic process of building an indigo vat and dyeing cloth is a extremely, it's toil and it's an extremely laborious, very delicate scientific process that takes years and years of study, years. I mean, it's an apprenticeship in most cultures, it's an apprenticeship system and it takes a very long time to learn how to even um, build a very fundamental dye bath. And so chemical dyes just cut through that process altogether. It meant, and it also meant that the women in particular in Nigeria and other places where women held power over dyeing, it broke down not only a social system, but also a spiritual system, a system of labor, et cetera. It was quite devastating because in Nigeria, in particular, women um, through indigo dyeing were able to accrue enormous amounts of wealth. They par had participation in political systems. There are there's a long history of political protest where Nigerian women were able to depose a king and really, you know, go up hard against the colonial government. And so this introduction of synthetic dye just it was devastating to that. It was devastating to that process. It was devastating to families who had the wealth now to walk away from the hardship of a life as dyers and to educate their children and to give all of these other opportunities through indigo wealth. So here comes the Germans to Nigeria. So for a brief moment, um, there was a kind of vigor in the market with indigo dye, particularly because all of a sudden this um, synthetic dye meant a faster process. You could do more, 
you could achieve darker colors for much less money. And it seemed like a revolution that everybody could get on board with, but um, they, they had to, at the same time, watch this breakdown of a complex kind of hier hierarchy of women and an erosion of an economic system. So there was a lot of tension between the women who had taken up synthetic dyes and those who wanted to carry on with this rich tradition that had you know, many, many meanings to the society. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Yoruba women always had this penchant for cosmopolitanism, for what was new, what was modern, as I was saying earlier. And um, so they started to break some of the traditions with the market and with the marketplace. And they were embracing this rapid innovation and happily adopting new materials, new designs, et cetera. And so when Mr. Hoffman from BASF Lagos landed in Ibadan, he went and met with one of the market queens whose name was Madame Federera. And he went to her with a specific business proposal. He cut through all of the hierarchy. He left out the people who he would have had to pay some kind of homage to or involved in this kind of discussion about what was happening with the marketplace. And the two of them took up a liaison that may or may not have been romantic, although oftentimes you saw the romantics stand in for, you know, it was like a shortcut to power. Um, and they started to travel about the country, touting these new dyes, people responding very excitedly, suddenly indigo dyeing or the promise of indigo wealth was something that everybody could have. And so Madame Federera set herself up as a wholesaler in a shiny new store among her colleagues. And she organized tie and dye training workshops for anyone who could attend. Whereas before you would start at the lowest level and you would go through this very long and involved apprenticeship and, and become um, a master dyer through a very intense kind of process. And at the same time, she was exercising a very strict control over the supplies and the distribution of the, of the new dyes. So it undercut the unions, it undercut the, the dyers who on one hand were able to depose a king and suddenly had this new enemy that they couldn't butt heads with. And the money was instead of going back into their communities, going into the hands of a foreign man and his associates and, and this woman. And it was the, really the beginning of the end of this really long, rich tradition of indigo cloth making. You can find indigo today. It usually has some chemical process involved in it. When I started doing my research for the book Indigo, I went to Nigeria, I had a, a list of dyers whose names were, had been given to me from different places and through a lot of careful research. And when, when I arrived each time, I would go to a compound somewhere where I knew that um, this dyer had lived. And I'd arrive at the compound and there's usually still some dyeing activity, but it would be a lot of very much older women, women in their seventies or eighties, and they would be dyeing with synthetic dyes, usually not with blues at all. And often the, the madam, the woman that I had come to see would have her grave there on the doorstep of the house. It's customary to, to marry someone, to bury somebody important at the, the place, at their family home. So it, BASF became the beginning and the end of really an empire that I think for a lot of people in the West is, is hard to understand. It was as large as any conglomerate on our side of the world. Maybe not Amazon large, but as large as any conglomerate of that of that age. And um, it, it was really the end of that and the end of a kind of art. And it coincided with the collapse of indigo in the world. So it, it's kind of the end of, um, of, what we've, of what we've treasured and this thousand, multi-thousand year tradition. So that's it for now. I'd like to talk to you. I can slow down talk to you more about the pictures or any questions that you have. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's, it's so, thank so you. interesting. And, um, and I, we planned to have this uh, a long time ago. And I, I love that it's during 
Women's History Month because there's there's so much about you know women in this story. So I wanted to say that at the beginning, but I will say it now. And uh-huh. and you you really make it clear how intricate um, the work of doing the actual indigo dyeing is. And and then I think it's so cool when you were describing how it's still not quite understood mm-hmm. how how it comes to be. And that is really a cool thing because, um, you know, as we talk about in our economic espionage gallery, you know, if you're trying to steal a secret, so how cool is this secret? Like we still don't actually know how exactly perhaps it works. So that's hard. And then there are some cool stories of, uh, folks trying to, um, you know, trying to, take the plants and cultivate them elsewhere? Yeah. Did you run across much of it? And, and that's the economic espionage, you know, and then yeah. try, the Dutch trying to do that. Could you comment about that at all? Absolutely. Well, the most famous is with um, Elizabeth Keckley. Yeah, not Keckley, what am I saying? <laughs> um, it, here in the U.S. With, um, with indigo, the plants were brought from from the Caribbean to the U.S. by botanists, and they worked very, very hard at making it work here, as, you know, as part of U.S. plantations. And it became it at, when it was successful. It was outpacing sugar and cotton and everything. Where did it grow in particular here in, in, in South the... Carolina? Yeah, yeah. It didn't do well. It doesn't do well in a North American context overall. But there are some select places where it's particularly good. Well, I know the Dutch tried to do it um, without success, didn't mm-hmm. they? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did. They they were stuck with woad until they hit West Africa. <laughs> That's it. Well, well, one of the things I want to say, and we have lots of questions, but I, mm-hmm. I wanted to share a few um, thoughts from from reading the book and uh, one sentence that I thought was was fascinating, which was just indigo is a cloth or a lesson in life's mysteries. Mm-hmm. And you really explain how it, you know, was a, a spiritual force and an economic force. And I have to say for folks who haven't read this book yet, kind of a spy, it's not a spy mission, but you are on a mission in exotic locations, searching for something. And I mean, it is incredible. As you see, you know, you get a lead and you're looking for a a dyer. So this book is, is really like an, an incredible mission through cool places. Uh, So if you're still dedicated to armchair travel, what was the most, did you ever feel, you know, What were your kind of most, you know, what was the most memorable aspect of this, this quest that you went on? I know it it seems so transporting, but was there, we always ask spies to tell us, what's your bond moment? Uh Did you have a really spine tingling moment on, on this quest? There were a lot because it really was so hard to find. So even just the sighting of, of something real was incredible, but then there were all these, you know, like all of a sudden, if you were in a market. And you looked across people's heads and you saw one person's head wrap and you knew that it was, you know, real Kano indigo. It was the real thing that could just, that would blow me away. And, you know, I would do everything I could to get close to that. But well, also, so you found your targets. I mean, it was really funny reading. I think like, she's got her target and then she tries to get access to them. So, you know, yeah. I've worked at the spy museum too long, but everything... <laughs> Well, and the access was always, you know, it was always interesting. And, but it also brought up in the community of people around you, it brought up a lot of feelings. And some of it was that, you know, indigo was something that wasn't around all the time and people didn't really have the same attachment to it. So who is this woman that all of a sudden wants to (laughs) put her hands on everything? So that, and, you know, there are a lot of ideas that a person's spirit is in in the cloth that they wear and so to want to possess someone's cloth is you know people look at with suspicion wow 
so so intense how did we got we got a lot of questions coming i've got questions coming from a variety of platforms but um how did you get interested in indigo uh, right off the bat we should it was always you know it, it was even as a young child i remember my grandmother gave me a damskin tie and dye blue and white tie and dye outfit and there was something about it it was it seemed very african to me in my child's mind and it was very beautiful. And I remember people complimenting it all the time. And it, you know, it was kind of like something that was so special. And I, I think, you know, they're funny kind of things like that. And then um, reading like the Sunday, the New York Times and getting the newsprint on your hands. Right. And, you know, the kind of like the tattooing of the newsprint. That was always fascinating to me. And Indigo Ink as a child, I think I was probably in school just when they were no longer using ink pens and ink wells. You know, you saw them a little bit, but they were disappearing. But I remember in grade school having an ink well on my desk that we actually used. And I just, I love that. I love the, the blue. Thing. We have we have a question directly about that. Does the uh -oh. India ink have indigo as a, comp a component? I'm sure it did. I, I'm, I wouldn't be able to tell you when you know, when it lost that. But yeah, I'm sure originally that was the case. And then it um, became something synthetic. What was the most traded um, uh, indigo? Um, probably the most traded would be the the Tuareg. Um, you know, you see them as, as head wraps. But with, in that case, that was kind of considered like a king of cloth. And that it was traded so much in the transit trans-Saharan trade. So it probably had the most circulation of anything, but it's also extremely costly because they're very fine strips of cloth that are sewn together. Some of them are only as big as the width that I'm showing you. And it's this gauzy cloth. And then they, um, it's dyed in indigo, it's very dark, but then they will take indigo and mix it with cow fat and then put it on a board and beat it you know, beat the, and then put a powder over, indigo powder over it. There's layers and layers of the dye. It's very, very costly. And that gives it the, the cow fat and the beading gives it that sheen. Wow. That yeah, that's beautiful stuff. Oh, that is, that is so cool. Yeah. Um, oh, here's someone back to the, the mission. Did you have any um, language barrier problems? You, you do. I mean, the funny thing, I live mostly in Ghana where in, English is the official language, but you'd be surprised how many people don't actually speak it and are, are not learning it in school. Um, you know, there's just, there's a good sense of humor and most of West Africa, Ghana in particular is very, everything is about contact. Like you don't do anything that is not about very intense human contact. So it almost doesn't matter if you're exactly getting the words right because people are with you, they're interested. And they're going to, you know, even if they can't stand you, they're going to be right there figuring it out with you. I enjoyed that quite a bit. I like, I like that idea. You know, here I live in New York, so you buy something and you barely meet somebody's eye and you just go in and do whatever and get out. But everything was an exchange and the exchanges all had a lot of meaning. So we figured it out. And I actually, I learned much more of a couple languages than I would have, you know. Guessed. Yeah. <laughs> um, were the were the um, fabrics? Are they cotton? Are they wool? Are they a variety? They everything. Some camel hair, um, sheep's wool, cotton, silks. Everything. It runs a gambit. But also traditionally, they would all. There was a lot of trade with Asia as well. So there were silks that were coming. But a lot in Ghana in particular. But I think it's the same everywhere else they'll undo the threads, they'll take apart a garment and reweave something. Yeah. So yeah. you would get silk threads that could have come from any number of places. And there are also, there are indigenous silks as well, like in Nigeria in particular. Um, got everybody, people are so, it's, it's everywhere. It's very cool, the different questions. People wanna know if, um, is indigo also used to dye like glass beads? Um, I'm sure there's some evidence of pigments, but I, I think it's so costly that it probably would not have been used in, in you know, indigenous glass beads in West Africa. 
So, and um, a lot of what you see now, a lot of the glass beads that you see now are more 20th century and um, quite a bit use recycled things because there's, there's still a big love for foreign, for imported beads. Oh, here's a, we're gonna, we are now entering into household hints. I love this. Someone has a tunic that they bought in Thailand that's dyed with indigo and it comes off yeah. on the person. And they wanted to know, um, they said they've tried to fix it by soaking it in vinegar. Is there a way to keep their indigo from bleeding onto other things? This is the, the only time we have given household <laughs> hints in a spy museum program, but I feel really good about it. So funny. How many times have you watched it? <laughs> That's so okay, we'll, they we'll can't see if they... Yeah, you, you have to, usually it takes several washings. I mean, the, the beauty of it, cultures in Asia and Africa like the instability of the color because Indigo, in fact, will never lose its color. I mean, it's the one thing, the color is so indelible. It, it will it will, shade, it will shift, there's instability, it will shed, but it will always be, you know, an intense blue. And so that's really favored, but I know for Westerners, we don't necessarily wanna, wanna wear something that's rubbing off. So yeah, keep trying the end. You could try salt instead of vinegar. Oh. And you can also try dry cleaning actually fixes it pretty well. And oh. So Oh, yeah. that's interesting. But it will it will stop. It's kind of like a, the Moroccan rug that's always losing, <laughs> you know, the beautiful rug that's always losing threads. <laughs> it's just giving. It's it's a gift to yes, us. Exactly. So, um, what's the most unusual? <laughs> <On your> eyes, <laughs> <or> <laughs> what's the most unusual thing you've seen indigo dyed? And I think this is a friend of yours who says hi from Adelie. Oh, hey Adelie, how are you? <laughs> The most unusual thing, well, the most, yeah, animals. I was, at, I went to um, Niger just before the Garawal. I'm sure you've all seen like the Fulani men that wear makeup and very tall, beautiful men, and they put on a kind of fashion show. So I was there just the week, we had to leave, but we were there the week before the Garawal, and they were um, putting indigo dye on, like on cows and camels and that sort of thing. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, I like a, a big circle on the back hump of the camel or something. Oh, I, I told you we were going to be transported yeah. today. Now I just want to see this camel beautiful. with a blue, <laughs> a blue hump. Yeah, that um, was great. <laughs> it, could you use the dye that comes off like to re-dye? So if something comes out in the water, if you washed it, can you use that dye? They pick up the dye, it would probably not be very fast because you don't have a mordant, you know, you're not putting it through a process. So it would be a very, like a temporary stain and then it would come out. Yeah. Um, someone, I sort of, are all the patterns made through stitching or are some of them, you know, resist, you know, batik, wax? Yeah, there's some, um, a lot are done. The Yoruba in particular use a cassava paste. And so I think I showed you that one slide. They they have young girls work on that. They use a chicken feather and they they paint I, the, the. Did that decoration. that word mean anything on that uh, one? Yeah, that one in particular is. Um, it's funny. I've had several people who are Yoruba speakers look at it, and none of us can. We can't piece it together. But a lot of the women who were dyers were illiterate, so they you know it could be a misspelling. But the closest we can get is that it says, this is not a curse. Oh. <laughs> and, I'll know, take the, it. The club, yeah, the cloth was often used in as a protective. Wow. Well, it, that. Like spiritual. That one, yeah. That one is so charming and it so is. whimsical it's looking. If yeah, a, this is a, a whole cloth. It's got birds all over it. It's gorgeous. And it, it's called yepe, meaning the birds are all here. Yeah. Here's one, here's a question above my pay grade in the textile world. Um, please compare the expense of ultramarine blue pigment from lapis lazuli with indigo dyes. That I can't really tell you because I haven't studied the two. I've studied them, you know, like with a friend of mine who works with them in her, in her art practice, but I haven't studied the economics or really the culture of the other two. So. Um, another, another one 
out of my wheelhouse. Would you say, based on your knowledge of indigo, that you can synthesize it from primary components? Um, no, I mean indigo. You you know, I don't know enough of what they're doing now with the um, the natural indigo kits that you can buy and that sort of thing. But the the like the true organic process of dye of making a vat from dried indigo balls to you know to what you see on the artist floor is it's it's literally building a vat of organisms and it's su it's such a careful process like you have the indigo balls you have to have um, usually they try to use rainwater there's urine or some other there's ash there are all these components but even then it's not enough to just have them the water can be tainted in the slightest of ways and it can destroy the bath. You know, it's like, think about it as trying to grow. I mean, it's even more delicate than seeds, but you're, you're really growing organisms out of, out of these materials and they can die so quickly. It can be too hot or too cold or something taints it. Some, I know artists that use honey. I know other artists that use figs. You know, some people will like human urine, others like a goat's urine. In in England, you would see the outside of the bars, they had big barrels that they would send the guys out to pee in the barrels and they would be used by the woad dyers, you know? And I guess they thought like urine that was soaked in beer <laughs> was the most effective thing. It's a, it's a very careful science and the people that I know who are dying in that way keep really careful records about how and what measures and, and mm -hmm. it never works a second time. Oh my gosh. It's like the best thing. Yeah. You cook. And it's, so yeah. it's so costly. So you're putting all this effort and money into growing this, vat that can change in a, in a heartbeat. And if it doesn't change, then you get a vat that dies slowly on a net in a natural way. And then it produces these beautiful, beautiful pale colors. That, you know, they call it, I forget what they call it. It's something about, it's like, um, it's like a new death or something like that, but it, oh, wow. it goes into almost like an eggshell blue color as it, oh. as that dies. Yeah. Um, is there any movement to kind of protect indigo? There is, there is. I mean, Japan, I think the Japanese government has been brilliant about honoring and protecting it as part of the national culture. And they, so they've probably done the best. Um, in Africa, there are particular art artisans, like there's Abubakar Fofana, who is in Mali. He's a um, calligrapher. He's done a lot of fine arts and then returned to his family's tradition. As a, as a boy, he used to travel to Guinea with a family member to buy Guinea dyes, which were considered the best and he had all, he had this memory of dying in his family with the women in his family and then he eventually started to study and practice and now he has a huge organic farm and he does these very wonderful workshops there oh that's well. great and then but he also went and studied for a time in in Japan with with master dyers and he's the only person i know of who would be considered at that master level i mean he's mm -hmm. truly he spent 30 years learning the practice. Is the indigo plant ever used in food? Um, that I don't know. Of. It, indigo is poisonous. It's, um, you know, if it, people, it's toxic. People that work it can become very sick at the same time that it's used in healing as well. So I don't know if it would be eaten so much, but um, it certainly had, it has a lot of use in, in healing and that sort of thing. And in, in the right measures, it's not unsafe for the body. Right. Um, when you were speaking earlier about, you know, it was a color of the elite at times, would you be punished if you wore indigo in, and it was? Yeah, in many, many, in many cultures in, in Africa and Europe in particular, I think the Europeans were probably the most brutal because they had the economic interest in protecting woad, you know, once, Indigo was being imported. Woad lost its traction altogether. But right. you know, as I was saying, Queen Elizabeth, they were beheading people that were caught um, cultivating it or or using it. 
And that that's one of the things we really wanted to get across in in that gallery that I mean, we just take color for granted yes. in many ways. And but that was intellectual property. And and, you know, I mean, uh, Louboutin has trademarked the red color of those shoes soles. Yeah. So it's still we have to remember that there's really nothing new under the sun in in mm-hmm. many ways. And so I, you know, people just don't have forgotten how valuable textiles and yeah were. Um, we have a question about, I don't know if um, you can comment on the connection between indigo and rice. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, in the American South, indigo really replaced rice in the Carolinas. It um, it was so lucrative that it replaced rice. I mean, at the end of, at the beginning of um, the Revolutionary War, indigo currency in the U.S. had had collapsed altogether, and they were using like tablets of indigo as currency. So it was Eliza Lucas, the, that is who I've been trying to That's his name. About. People know Eliza Lucas. Eliza Lucas was the person that like, who quote unquote brought, you know, she was a governor's daughter. Her father was the governor of Barbados, but they had several plantations. One was in the Carolinas and she brought indigo. She brought indigo to the US economy. And, but she was lucky in the fact, in the sense that she had captive people on the plantation who had expertise in indigo and knew exactly how to make it and wow. process it. And um, the thing with indigo, the, not only was it important as an export to England, but it was also, it kept, it extended the lives of slaves because it, got rid of snakes. You know, there were a lot of poisonous snakes and people were working in the fields and were were bitten by them. Um, Mosquitoes, it repelled mosquitoes. So they had less problems with malaria, et cetera. And so it was extending the lives of the enslaved population in addition to the wealth of, of the actual product. So, and at the same time, it was a brutal crop. And so, you know, it was also, it was killing its workers and extending their lives long enough to extract enough labor <laughs> to to then kill them off. So it's a huge part of American history and we don't we don't pay much attention to it at all. And we don't connect denim to the history of, of slavery. No. And we don't connect intellectual property to enslaved people. So. Well it's this is so interesting what you are are revealing and before I wrap it up, I know we're getting close to the hour, but can you just say where your the wonderful photos that you were sharing of, of families and individuals, where are those ones you've collected or where have they? Well, um, a few of them, the first one, the color photo is actually, that's a Bubakara Fofana's hands. And <laughs> so I took that from him, but the others are from, they're from my collection. I have a personal archive, the McKinley collection which is, um, it represents the earliest African, the earliest photography on the African continent through the contemporary. And my new book, The African Lookbook is made up of those. It's a, it's, it's a fashion history, but it looks at this 150 year arc of photography. That is exactly what I wanted you to say because <laughs> it, is a, it is a glorious book. I have looked at it. Um, PDF wise, but I look forward to getting my my hands on on a real um, you know copy. Well, it's in your store, right? It's in my store, and I I'm, I'm looking forward to spending more time at the museum and in the store. Yeah. And I just want to thank you so much, Catherine. This was so Thanks interesting. Thank you. And I I want to thank our our guests for um, being with us today. And um, we can't do our programs without you. We hope you've enjoyed this. We have two cool programs coming up next week, um, Crossfire Hurricane and then Spy Chat. Those are on Wednesday and Thursday, both at noon. They are free programs, very different than this one, but these are all cool free programs. And if you enjoy our programs, and you feel like you would be willing to make a contribution to the Spy Museum's Mission Resilience Campaign, 
to thank us. We'd sure appreciate it. And buy Catherine's books. Uh, I thought you said buy Catherine. <laughs> oh, buy Catherine's books and buy Catherine. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Such a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Stay well. Thank you.